So we know, roughly speaking, what the goals should be because Europe would have to cut by 80% to get down to two tons per capita. So that 80% cut for the rich countries in the context of a 50% cut overall, 1990 to 2050. It doesn't come out of nowhere, it comes out of the arithmetic and we have to make that case very clearly. We cannot expect developing countries yet to take on fixed targets here in Copenhagen at the end of this year. But they are looking very hard, very hard at this issue, particularly China and India, who know how vulnerable they are and they know their potential deal breakers. That concentrates the mind. I've been working in India for 35 years, in China for 20, living for long periods in both countries. And over the last two years, the pace and intensity of the public discussion on this, is, this issue has been quite remarkable. You're seeing climate change action plans of really a quite interesting kind in Brazil and South Africa and China and India. They're all different and some of them we wish would be uh, a bit stronger, but this is really strong engagement. What we have to do as a rich world is ask the question, how can we support you in these climate change action plans? How can we get together and support the action that you're taking to try to combine growth and development and poverty reduction and a movement to low carbon growth? That's our challenge. Please don't use the language, how do we bring China and India and developing countries into the deal? That is a fundamental mistake. The key question is, how can we as a world act together and support each other, and in particular, how can we as a rich world act to support you, given the past responsibilities and given your um, overwhelming and very understandable wish to overcome poverty in your country? That's the way we have to think about this. The developing countries should be in the lead. They're 8 billion out of the 9 billion of currently developing countries in uh, 2050. Uh, they're hit earliest and hardest. It should be the developing world that's explaining to the rich world what the global deal should look like. And we know, roughly speaking, the numbers. We can see the climate change action plans. We can see what's involved in supporting them and, and supporting still stronger ambition, which is possible if that support comes along. What does it mean? It means carbon finance, so carbon trading will be a big part of that. It means sharing and developing technologies together. It means working with each other to stop deforestation. It means resources for adaptation. We can see what it means to support the developing world in its challenge of coping with climate change, which is of course happening, and we call that adaptation. We should really talk about development in a more hostile climate. There's no separate subject, adaptation and development. This is development in a more hostile climate. But it does more, involve more resources. We underestimated, those of us at the UN Financing for Development Conference in Montreux in 2002, and, and I wrote the report to the Commission for Africa before the Stern Review, which uh, led up to the Glen Eagles meeting in 2005 with the G8. We underestimated the resources because we didn't take strongly enough into account climate change. This is the kind of analysis we have to do, and the developing world in this context will be and should be placing conditions on the rich world. This is conditionality from the developing world to the rich world. You take at least 80% cuts. You show us some of these low-carbon technologies, show us they work. You do the trading schemes, and uh, some of the resources will flow to us because we have quite a few options of low-cost uh, reductions. You share the technologies with us, and you support us with adaptation. These are our conditions. We understand how important all this is, and together we can deliver. This is the developing world in the leaders, as is absolutely natural given the history and given the challenges coming. And I believe that with that kind of perspective on those issues, with the kind of elements of the global deal that I've itemized, we can get there. And I believe that we can get there Actually, I'm more optimistic than I was two years ago. Why? Because of work of people like you that have deepened the understanding. Secondly, because the technologies have been moving so fast. You can't give a talk on climate change to an audience of industrialists without going home with a pocket full of cards of people with fantastic ideas. Probably 70% probably of them potty, silly. But if 30% of them are good, that would be fantastic. And uh, the way in which technology has been moving, of course, in many ways driven by you scientists, has been quite phenomenal. When you guys concentrate your mind on a problem, 
when everybody realizes just how damaging HIV AIDS is, and all, not all of course, but many scientific technological minds focus, results come. And uh, just as uh, Diana showed that uh, behavior can change, so too can our understanding of these issues. And I believe that you've done a tremendous job in doing that. So the second reason I'm more optimistic is how fast technology has changed. And the third reason is that commitments have started to come. Barack Obama has committed very clearly to 80% reductions by 1990. And the discussion I was in the United States last week on spent a lot of time in Congress, particularly with people who haven't been taking climate change seriously, that discussion is becoming more intense. Those of us who do a lot of work in China will know that the work they're doing on their energy strategy, which will form a key element of the 12 five-year plan, start at the beginning of 2011, they're concentrating like mad. We've really seen political change. So for all those three reasons, the depths of public understanding, the technology and the political change we're seeing, I think we've got a better chance of than, had them on this, much better chance on this had the uh, Copenhagen Conference uh, than we would have had had the Copenhagen Conference been two years ago. That doesn't mean that it's easy. We all know it's going to be very tough, but we can get there. And finally, it's going, it should be, easier because we've got an economic crisis. Don't let anybody tell you that the economic crisis means we have to put this to one side. This is an opportunity. Resources like the construction labour needed for insulating houses are cheaper now. The returns over 10-15 years will be roughly what they would have been in the past. We will come out of this crisis. But the costs are cheaper now during the depths of a recession. There are lots of infrastructure projects we could be bringing forward. We could go very strongly for the smart grid and the, uh, um, the high voltage DC transmission technologies that John brought forward. There are lots of things that we can do. And actually this crisis is a two or three year crisis, not a one or two year crisis. So we don't have to apply the criteria that the shovels have to hit the ground this year. The more that do, the better but they can hit the ground next year too and still have a big effect on what is going to be an extended crisis. We should know from this crisis that if we postpone looking risk in the face, that it will bite us much more deeply. Surely that's a lesson for climate change. We should know from this crisis that we don't want to come out of this like we came out of the bursting of the dot-com bubble. What did we do? We sowed the seeds of the housing bubble. Coming out of this one, We've got to lay the foundations for the low carbon growth that's going to be like the railways, like electricity, like the motor car, that's IT. This is going to be over the next two or three decades the big driver of investment and growth. We must be laying the foundations for that now. So don't let anybody tell you that the economic crisis is a cause for postponing. That is just confused analysis. This is an opportunity which we have to take. And if we do take that opportunity, I believe that we can tackle simultaneously the two great problems of the 21st century. One is the battle against poverty and the other is managing climate change and we will succeed or fail on those two problems together. Thank you very much.